Okay. Yes, I can see it now. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. I, I do have a small window that uh, shows you folks. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and uh, what I, as a reminder, I'd like to have everyone mute unless you're going to make a comment or a question. We'll keep the uh, ambient noise down. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I wish we could have done this in person, but um, this is the next best thing. And uh, the, the only silver lining, in my opinion, of this virus is that it's uh, helped us to get better with this kind of technology. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first slide here just kind of shows the area where you guys are, because I've got some uh, guest forest rangers watching this presentation. I want to give them an, an idea of the type of peninsula you're on and the remoteness of the area on the mid coast in Phippsburg. And this is a close up of the three communities that we've been uh, dealing with for this community wildfire protection plan. And this is uh, just a tax map with some uh, handwritten comments in there. Um, so you see Brightwater, Winburg, and Winburg East. So all this whole program kind of gets started based on the Sheep Island fire. And I'm, I, I didn't want to bring back any bad memories, but you know, it, it's, it's not that unusual for a community to contact us after they've had a close call like this. And this was a very serious situation um, back in 2016. This picture was taken from the, uh, or somehow got to the Portland Press Herald. I don't know if maybe one of you guys took it. And here's a photo that was taken from the air, how close the, uh, the wildfire got to the cottage along the shoreline. And then a, a clearer picture taken a few days later of the burn area on Sheep Island, which is uh, visible from the three communities that we started with. That's my house with a green roof there. Oh, in the foreground? Yes. Okay. Um, so moving along, we'll um, get called by Peter and George. I think it was in uh, shortly after that fire. And then we started the Community Wildfire Protection Plan in the fall of 2017. So usually we try to do this presentation uh, the next spring, but we, we decided to do some other things in the last couple of years for our FireWise Education Day. Um, so I'm glad to get this kind of caught up. Um, I'm going to go into some objectives now with the CWPP, if you don't mind me using that abbreviation. Uh, the goal, obviously, is to uh, kind of check out the risk of wildfire and identify some uh, mitigation strategies. How can we reduce that risk of wildfire? The objective is to you know, minimize, minimize the ability of the fire to move in between wildland uh, forested areas and the structures, there, therefore, thereby reducing the threat to life and property. And I'll go over some, uh, some more definitions. Sometimes I, I, I won't say Community Wildfire Protection Plan, I'll say CWPP. Um, and I often say WUI, which is the abbreviation for Wildland Urban Interface, which is defined as uh, where the homes meet the forest. And uh, just as in some other information, wildfire can spread to structures in these WUI areas, either directly or indirectly. So directly would be the fire that comes along the surface and ignites a structure and then keeps on going and, and along the surface and ignites another structure indirectly would be through ember impingement so that the the i'm trying i'm trying not to talk with my hands here but um if there's a, a structure fire that's sending up a lot of flames and heat into the atmosphere that the embers could carry uh, a, a distance of a quarter mile half mile or so and then land somewhere that would be indirect so these WUI areas create unique challenges for both wildland and structural firefighters. And a little background on fires in Maine. We typically have about 500 wildfires each year on average, 
and that usually uh, damages or destroys about 25 structures. Uh, the average amount of acreage burned each year is about 400, uh, but occasionally wild. Uh, most, so most of the fires are small, but that doesn't mean they do a lot of damage or they, or they can't do damage. They do. And once in a while, we get fires over 200 acres, which we've had a couple this year. So the current fire activity, and this was uh, as of Friday, um, we've had 718 wildfires, which have burned 880 acres which is the second highest total for the entire year in the past decade. And of course, 75% of these fires, uh, we, we keep track of this, they either destroy, damage, or threaten structures. And uh, I got an update this morning, and over the weekend we had 11 more fires statewide that burned a total of seven acres. So we're now almost up to 750 fires and almost 900 acres. So this is, this is quite a year. But um, just reflecting back on the year of the Sheep Island fire was 2016. We did have a dry spell there in that June when that fire occurred. So uh, we welcome this rain here now. And uh, I've got some slides about the drought in a few minutes we'll talk about. But um, the top three causes for wildfires in Maine so far this year is uh, debris burning, which is the top photo there where people are uh, trying to uh, mitigate some of the brush in their yard or clear out brush and they they have a brush pile usually with a permit and somehow the fire escapes or they leave it under unattended and it ignites the next day after they have left that's very common um, and then in the lower left hand corner we've had an increase in what we call equipment cut equipment caused fires and I don't know if this would really affect your area. There's, there's not a whole lot of logging um, in the mid-coast area, Phippsburg. Um, but equipment caused fires could also be call, caused by someone with a brush cutter, you know, uh, like a, a beefed up weed whacker or even a chipper. Any kind of equipment that can generate uh, movement on, on a rock where there's dry soil um, could start fires. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen a spike in this year is in the bottom right hand corner, a campfire caused fires. There's been an increase in those and not only because of the dry conditions, but I think a lot of people have been uh, cooped up in their house in the spring and they were anxious to get out and, and uh, go camping or maybe even a campfire in their backyard and uh, they don't they don't take care of these fires and properly extinguish them and they escape. And if you can look at this one in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that even though they had a pretty large uh, rock ring around this campfire, it uh, when it was left unattended, it still burned the um, organic matter in the soil and burned up towards the upper left hand corner of the photo. I don't know how many acres this burned, but it must have smoldered and and, and, and burnt slowly over a couple days before it was even noticed. So just a reminder about the danger of uh, leaving campfires uh, unextinguished and unattended. So here's a little bit about uh, the drought that I guess we're still in. We'll see what the reports are, but uh, I think we've got a couple inches of rain in, in the uh, Phippsburg area, fortunately. But you can see kind of the different areas of the state that were under the moderate drought. And then this was the uh, uh, departure, uh, you know, how many inches of rain we normally have. So you see, it looks like on Friday, we were about three inches down and maybe, maybe we got that, who knows? And, and there's still some more rain in the forecast. So we'll see how that goes. So um, moving on, um, the first part of uh, starting a, a CWPP is to do wildfire risk assessments. And uh, we did those back in the fall of 2017, and we, we try to do them as randomly as possible so we don't uh, allow any bias to get in. If, if a forest ranger or, or a, a local firefighter was to just drive down the roads in, in your communities and, and just pick these things without using a random source, they might only pick the easy ones or they might pick the ones that have a lot of brush around them. And uh, we wanted a fair representation 
So we spent about a day doing this. I think there was three or four of us, and we we had um, Chief Andy Hart with us, and I think another firefighter or two. So uh, we we we, we like to do these uh, risk assessments with the fire department, and obviously let the community know that we're going to be there. And we did we did some by request, I believe. Um, so we ended up doing 22 of them, and each. Each assessment um, has 23 questions. Basically, you looked at the exterior of the structures, the access, and the nearby vegetation, as well as the water availability and the and the type of uh, response from the local fire department. And it kind of quantifies things. Um, it's you get a numeric score, and then that gets assigned to a hazard level, which we'll talk about in a minute. So see what we have to look forward to this fall, the beautiful foliage. So one thing that we, uh, it's quite apparent that is a, of concern is the access roads in your communities. Um, they're in various degrees of uh, risk. Um, obviously, the Brightwater area has the narrowest roads and Winburg East has the most, has the widest roads, but in between, uh, this is something that we looked at and we put a score to this and it's it's not an easy thing to correct. Um, I've seen some other communities that they can't make their roads any wider without bringing in a blasting crew and blasting through ledge, which is very expensive. But I have seen a lot of progress with just the uh, uh, cutting back the brush along the roads. And, and not only does that help with the uh, reduce the risk of fire, but also helps with visibility and uh, if there is a worst case scenario where you have to get out of there in a hurry, you, you can get out pretty quick. We also look at defensible space and uh, that's that's the area and I have a chart here that I'll show you in a minute, but within about 30 feet of, it, of any structure, we like to have that, veg, that vegetation managed in a way that it would uh, not carry a, a surface fire. So um, I hope that I don't uh, point out any uh, dangerous things to any people on the uh, video call today. And we tried to do these photos somewhat randomly. So it's not to point the finger at anyone, but just as an example of some of the things that we see in, in uh, throughout the community. So um, if we did get one of your, uh, your cottages or houses, um, it wasn't to, uh, that's my little disclaimer. We don't want to uh, embarrass anyone, but the upper left-hand corner, you've got a lot of vegetation right near the, the deck. Um, below that is kind of a, an example of a better defensible space. You can see the uh, there's grass along here and just one shrub here. Um, and, but you've got this uh, typical cedar shake shingle siding that can carry a fire. If you were to get any uh, embers coming in here, it would be pretty easy for it to ignite down below here. Um, and then upper right hand corner, I think that's one of our vegetation plots. You, you don't see a structure in there. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, bottom right corner, you see the uh, rhododendron up near the, uh, the back porch. And then there's area underneath here where vegetation can get in and also embers. Uh, if there was a, it was a structure fire or a woods fire nearby and the wind was blowing hard, it could get way up underneath there. So it's something we saw throughout the community and is fairly easy to correct. Um, you could put a screen down underneath there, also keeps the critters out. Uh, you could put rocks down here rather than uh, organic combustible material that would, would carry a fire. So this is the graph that I was going to talk about. Um, uh, the folks at uh, NFPA who run the Firewise program, they just updated this graph a few years ago, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of share it with uh, the folks from Phippsburg as well as some of the rangers on the call. Um, they call these home ignition zones, and the, the one, the closest one to the house is the interme is the immediate zone, zero to five feet, and then the intermediate zone, five to thirty feet and the extended zone 30 to 100 feet. And I know this doesn't look anything like uh, your, your community, but it does show um, the different 
uh, zones and how much emphasis should be placed on each zone. So you notice for the immediate zone, it's a red, it's a red polygon that encircles this zone up to five feet. That is the one you want to spend the most time on within five feet of the house. And then it, as you get a little bit further out, five to 30 feet, that's orange. That's some, you, you need to spend some time on that, but not as much. And then less time as you get out to 100 feet. And um, I'm just going to do a quick review of this um, immediate zone, just so you know what I'm talking about. This is stuff where you would, you would clean the roof and the gutters of dead leaves and debris and, and pine needles that could catch embers. Uh, you replace or repair any loose or missing shingles, roof tiles, because you don't want embers to penetrate. And uh, some of the other things, move any flammable m materials away from wall exterior. So I see that a lot. I see some people put mulch down along the edges of their foundation or their, their structure, and it's always better to use stones or something not, not flammable, not combustible. And uh, it also reminds that not... And we talked about this in the last picture that you want to remove any any combustible materials stored underneath the decks. So just a good overview of that. Another thing we looked at with the wildfire risk assessments is uh, building materials. And we'll go through these slides uh, briefly, but you can see we've got the, you know the log cabin very combustible, um, and as well as like this this deck or maybe a little bit of a walkway here with room underneath where uh, fire could carry or embers could get in. And here's an example to the top right corner of uh, a lot of pine needles on a roof. And, you know, the roof is asbestos. It's not likely to burn. But if you did get an ember to land there uh, during one of these these drought periods, it could actually uh, ignite those needles and then they could drip down almost like rainwater. Uh, and they could land into a spot uh, like in the slide below um, bottom right hand corner where you see the um, the fencing with a little gap there and a lot of vegetation and rocks uh, and it could ignite something down there and the bottom left is just an example of um, i think someone has kind of boarded up there uh, underneath their deck which is good um, so embers and fire can't get in there but it's also important that you don't allow uh, uh, leaves and needles and wood debris to build up in these areas. Water availability. Well, this is always a concern uh, for these remote communities and um, you're surrounded by salt water, so it's obviously affected by the tide. So um, I don't know if uh, Chief Hart got on the call, but um, I think in a pinch, they would use salt water uh, for a wildland fire or a structure fire. It is pretty corrosive on the fire pumps and, and hoses and equipment, but um, it's, it seems to be what you have. And I think they probably would haul in water from another area where they have a dry hydrant, fresh water that is. So um, we can talk about that a little more at the end, but you certainly have your challenges. Um, so we did the 22 uh, wildfire risk assessments, but we also wanted to kind of take a look at the, the amount of vegetation buildup uh, in the forested areas away from the structures, because that tells us a few things. It tells us, you know, uh, how much the duff, how deep the duff layer is, uh, which is the organic layer. So if you do have a fire, um, is there enough material there that it could carry and also uh, it could extend the the time that it takes to put the fire out. So if you've got a lot of debris, there hasn't been a fire there for decades to burn up that debris, it keeps falling. Um, so that's one thing to think about. So we looked at the vegetation type, the fuel density, the fuel bed depth, and whether the canopy closed, that canopy cover, but what, you know, were the edges of the trees touching each other in case, uh, worst case scenario, you had a uh, crown fire. <clears throat> So here's some of the, uh, the results on the access roads and, and signage. I didn't mention that before, but it's very important to have signs in these remote communities because it's not an everyday occurrence that the uh, uh, fire or EMS are there 
and they, they, you know, GPS is only as good as the data that's put in there. So in the past, it might have been pretty easy to say, yeah, there's there's a medical problem at the at the Smith cottage down down some road and everyone in the community would know. But when you get these extreme conditions, drought conditions, you might actually have another fire department responding because the other one's tied up with another fire. So it's very important for fire access to label your, your address. Um, so 85% of the homes only had one access road in and it was pretty narrow, less than 24 feet in width. 90% of the structures were on access roads that had that were longer than 300 feet in length. So that also is a factor in the time that it takes to get there and for them to find you. And I think the signs have been improved on this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask that question and give myself a break to drink some water. But uh, George, did you guys put some signs up in the communities or Peter? Yeah, we did. Uh, we got uh, everybody in Lindbergh. Uh, to put up uh, good numbers on their houses. So Winberg, I know, is in good shape. I thought I remember seeing those. Yeah. We and was that was that an expensive thing? Did you guys was it each person did their own, or you guys chipped in, or we each did our own. We got you know the stick on numbers that you could put on your Eve line and at, at your mailbox, and they're they're pretty clear. Yeah. Very good, every little bit helps. All right, we'll keep moving along here. Um, so some of the other results from the wildfire risk assessments. Uh, defensible space was the highest concern. 30% um, of the structures had less than 30 feet. And you know, when we were walking around these uh, cottages looking at the defensible space, if you had three sides with some, some pretty good clearance and one side didn't have good clearance, then then we we counted that as not good. In other words, we we wanted to bring people's we wanted to bring it to people's attention that you know fire knows no boundaries. It doesn't care about uh, what town you're in, whose property you're on. It just where there's fuel for it to burn, it will burn. So um, it's very common uh, in, in wooded areas that a lot of time is spent on the, the front yard that shows from the road and no time is spent on the backyard. Um, and that's where the vegetation comes right up, but the fire doesn't know any difference in those cases. So 30% of the structures um, had less than 30 feet and 70% of the structures had between 30 and 70 feet, which is a little bit better. But um, just a word about that, uh, when we say defensible space, we, we certainly don't mean every tree will be cut down or every shrub. Um, you, you don't live in Maine, you don't own this property um, to live in a parking lot, um, but there is, there's, there's ways you can be smart about your defensible space. And you know, instead of having a clump of trees that's connected to the, the forest, um, sort of like a wick, you know, in a row, you can just break them up. So if you have little islands of vegetation surrounded by well-watered grass, which is not likely to burn, then then you reduce that risk of that uh, surface fire coming from the woods to the structure. Whoops. So some of the surrounding vegetation, um, let's see, they had a high rating for hazardous vegetation near the structure. That was a that was of a concern too. And when I when I what I mean by that is, there's a lot of softwood um, in the in your communities, and they tend to burn much more rapidly than hardwoods because there's a lot of resins in the bark and the needles and stuff. Not that hardwoods won't burn. But that's that's same, something that we're concerned about, and you guys have done a lot of work on that since we started. So, and here's the kind of the average results summary. We kind of put a number to the 22 wildfire risk assessments, and it averaged out to be moderate risk level, which is pretty common. Uh, 
the the wildfire risk assessment format that we use is is a nationally based assessment so it does not take in consideration that you're on a peninsula and that you're in Maine and you have softwood it's, so it's it's kind of a generic generic way to look at these things but we've been using it since the oh early 2000s and we want to kind of keep consistency with our with our numbers so you guys came in at 68% moderate 32 percent high and we also looked at the building materials um, most of the structures had good roofs with the the uh, uh, asbestos shingles or whatever they're using nowadays um, but there was quite quite a lot of uh, roof litter 55 percent and also uh, in the fall time it was when we did these risk assessments is a little bit uh, different because not as many people are around but we did see a lot of uh, leaves and needles on decks as well which can also uh, ignite if there's embers headed there uh, water availability we talked about that it's it's certainly a challenge there um, but there were some dry hydrants in the area i can't think of where they are right now but uh, generally the response time would be an hour or less by ranger 45 minutes or less for aircraft and we saw that with the Sheep Island fire. So um, I wanted to show a picture of good defensible space so you kind of get an image of what I'm talking about. The, the grass and the shrubs for this, uh, for this home are kept short and the vegetation, it doesn't provide a direct path to the wooded area. Um, now there's the fire break in the, in the bottom right corner here. That's, I call it a fire break. It's probably a driveway or a path but that does function as a fire break. And another part of defensible space that we didn't really mention was if, if there was a fire coming from the left side of the screen towards this structure, the firefighters can get in and defend it. They, you know, there's room for them to move around. And, and I'm not sure that this happened um, for, for the reasons of firefighting. It may have just been good landscaping. And, and we certainly encourage that. People take care of their properties and Keep, them, keep that uh, brush from taking over. Um, in this case, uh, left, the left picture, we've got some firewood that's right near the uh, structure. And again, this is probably taken in the fall, so they're maybe gearing up for winter, but uh, we've had several structures that were completely lost because an ember from another fire got into their firewood pile, ignited that, and then ignited the house. So. Um, I, I mean, I burn firewood at home and I, I do the uh, 50 foot lug with it, in, you know, all winter long. I keep a little bit in the house once there's snow on the ground, but that's something to think about. And of course, propane tanks are always a concern. Um, if you can keep them away from structures, that's better. But most of them have already been installed by now. Um, in, the, in the case of this one, it's there's there's not a whole lot of vegetation around it. So if it's only just a little bit of needles and leaves, it's probably not going to ignite this. This thing's going to take a, uh, a long 15, 20 minute period of sustained heat to uh, to go off and cause any problems. So this isn't too bad. They've got, they've got it on a concrete block here. So keep that in mind. Um, and this is a picture that I showed before of a vegetation plot. Um, we only did a couple of those, but um, they were in the moderate risk category. Again, the, uh, the softwood here, this little spruce or whatever, could, could torch and light some of the other stuff on fire. Um, there's a lot of uh, dead and down material, just the nature of the, uh, how the community was created. It probably was a uh, sheep pasture 100, 150 years ago and then was abandoned and the trees just came in any which way. So I, I always encourage people if they if they own property to uh, talk with a, a consulting forester or a state forester about maybe doing some uh, forest management in areas like that to kind of keep things in check. But um, that's not really what we go into with the CWPP, but um, we, we do have a uh, state forester available to talk with you folks if you have any land that you'd like to manage. So the, the fuel beds in the uh, veg plots were uh, three to seven inches deep. So I would just dig down until I got to mineral soil and then that's, that would support substantial ground fire. 
and also as we call it the, the mop up phase of the fire would be uh, several days to get that out. So here we're starting to summarize things. We're getting near the end here. And um, some of the primary concerns within the wildland urban interface are the, the defensible space and the type of vegetation surrounding structures. Um, the access roads we talked about. Uh, the signage has been improved a little, and but we can always do more. And the inconsistent water availability, that's a difficult thing. Um, but uh, we have to kind of take another look where the dry hydrants are and the type of equipment that would be hauling in the water. Um, vegetation type and whether the canopies are closed, whether the the softwood trees are touching crowns so they could potentially carry a crown fire. So um, we've given some suggestions along along the way, but I've got a few more here um, that were found in the the, the report itself. We, we recommend increasing the defensible space, uh, try to maintain watered lawns and clean up the woody debris near structures. And you can uh, thin and prune trees around the homes. It's time for my uh, disclaimer, which I always say is, um, please check with the local code enforcement officer before you do any uh, cutting or uh, trimming of brush that's within the shoreland zone. Um, our, our recommendations to reduce the risk of fire do not override the shoreland zoning zone rules. But you can, um, you can prune trees within the shoreland zone a little. You never want to take more than two thirds of the crown of a tree. But uh, if, you, if you have low uh, hanging softwood branches that could, uh, we call them ladder fuels, they could, a surface fire could be carried up into the crown and torch that tree and, and, and help the fire spread. You can uh, prune those up to oh, four or five feet and that also makes it easier to mow your lawn. Um, but what we understand that sometimes people like those low hanging branches for privacy. They don't necessarily want to look at their neighbor or uh, the road or whatever it is. So it's um, something that's just a suggestion. Other actions to uh, reduce the risk of fire, clean the gutters, uh, stay on that a couple times a year. The spring and the fall is always a good idea. Um, many people don't realize that we have uh, our peak amount of fires usually are in the spring. And some of you might not even be back to your cottages until uh, Memorial Day weekend. But um, if you try to get most of those leaves and needles off in the late fall before you uh, return to your other homes, then that helps a little bit because if you follow s these recommendations, in theory, your your home should be able to uh, survive a low intensity surface fire or or embers hitting it, even if you're not there. That's that's the goal here is to make your home safe from fire. Um, so if you have the opportunity to enclose your uh, decks. Um, you know, put a roof over and a screen or something like that, that definitely reduces the likelihood of an ember lighting it on fire, keeps the bugs away too. We talked about keeping firewood stacked away from the home. Uh, it, if it's possible to widen the roads or even just a few um, turnouts. So, uh, you know, you get a worst case scenario where it hasn't rained for a month <coughs> and there's a structure fire or a forest fire way in on one of the remote roads. You might have a lot of people visiting because it's 4th of July, July weekend or something. Well, they're going to be leaving in a hurry when the fire trucks are trying to come in. So, and with smoke in the air, that's that's a, uh, a situation that we, we want to avoid. You could have accidents, people going off the road into the ditch. Um, so th again, that's a worst case scenario, but some of it would be solved if you could add a few uh, turnouts. But I know there's challenges there with land ownership and even just the amount of ledge and, and stuff there. Um, if you have the option of keeping your propane tanks away from the structures, that, that's always a good thing. And uh, any kind of new development, uh, try to incorporate these firewise practices. Um, I've seen some fairly new communities that end up having a low score on their wildfire risk assessments. 
because the land has recently been cleared so they can build. But it doesn't take long, as you know, 10 or 15 years, and the, the vegetation just works its way back in. So it's better to do a little bit each year and try to stay on top of it. And you guys have, are one of our uh, eight Firewise USA sites, and you've done a great job with that. Um, you've been participated in our brush chipping program, and you've gone above and beyond um, what we do with our one day per community per year. And uh, it's it's very it's, it's starting to make a difference. I can I see it when I drive down in there. But just a little bit of a review of what the Firewise program is. It's a, it's a voluntary program to help neighbors work together and take action to increase the ignition resistance of their homes in the community. Our defensible space chipping program, um, we, we offer that service uh, once a year per community and uh, you guys have done a great job with that. I think we're gonna try to schedule something. George, did we end up Doing something in mid-August is that? Yes, we, we, you you gave us uh, 11 August, uh, and so I'm notifying everybody, and we'll get the forms out for people to sign to request uh, the material clearance. And 11 August is going to be the day, and it's going to be good. Okay, I have kind of a new version of the form that I'll try to send you right after the call. Here, I just made a note about that. Excellent. Um, it's it's very similar, but you know we do want to uh, be safe uh, when when talking to uh, me or any of the other uh, summer interns that are loading brush. We um, <clears throat> obviously shouting at someone at a close proximity is not a not a good thing anymore. Um, so if we do need to communicate while we're running the chipper, which is very loud, we'll try to uh, step away and and keep um, adequate uh, distance. And what we realized was that if people get their materials out to the road, then there's no interaction with the outside team. So uh, it should be safe for both groups. And I think that uh, will be a, a perfectly reasonable uh, strategy. So we're not going to get free lemonade from, from the, the kids down the road? We, we <laughs> will uh, have a lemonade stand down at the dock for you and... Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. I think that's a good idea, and I'm glad you guys are able to participate. And don't feel any pressure. You know, um, if if there's not as many uh, people coming up this summer due to the virus or whatever, uh, if you don't if you don't fill the truck twice and you only fill it once, it's it still helps. And yep. and we have noticed in the past that communities that start in with this chipping program, they they kind of taper off after a number of years. They're, they're, not that they're ever going to get caught up. But um, don't don't feel pressure from us. Uh, whatever you have, we'll we'll come down and we'll take care of it within one day. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, also, the fire department we offer training with the basic wildland firefighting course, and uh, more uh, wildland urban a interface specific course is called S215. Uh, we haven't done much training this year because of the pandemic, but we're going to get back on on schedule with that for next year probably. And there's, there's sources for funding. Uh, I administer the Federal Access Property Program, which um, gets uh, military surplus equipment for communities. And we haven't done much with that lately, but th that program's still going on. And then the Volunteer Fire Assistance Program, it's a 50-50 cost share program for wildland fire equipment through the fire department. So uh, you guys are welcome to Talk to Chief Hart about that, and the assistance to the firefighters grant program is through uh, Department of Homeland Security. So we have made it to the end. Um, I'm going to take this screen down and we'll have a little discussion, but I thank you so much for your attention and your interest and, and your time this morning. And look, we got 10 minutes left. So I will close this thing out and see if I can come back. I see George.
Well, we're still recording. I see the, the button on there. <coughs> OK, well, thank you guys for listening. Uh, did you have any questions or concerns? Yeah, we got a question over here. Go um, ahead. Which, which oh, one you're muted. Uh, so this is Robin Johnson. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, we are about to have 25 or 30 hemlocks removed, dead hemlocks, uh, mm -hmm. because you inspired us about how important that is to do. And we were planning to have the trees just chipped and the chips sprayed on the property. It's going to be over about an acre. Is that safe to do? Or should yeah, good question. Plan? Yeah, um, uh, I think it is. Uh, these wood chips, if they're spread out and not not piled, left in right. piles, they, they have very low uh, likelihood of igniting. Uh, they, they're kind of going to hold the moisture on the ground. Okay. So as long as you don't have like a 10 foot high pile or something, I think that's a great idea. And they'll deco decompose pretty fast, much right. faster okay. than trees would. Okay, great, good. That's reassuring, thank you very much. Yep. Oh, Susan, you had a question? No, I... Unmute. You have to unmute, Susan. <clears throat> so if you touch your screen, you'll get a little uh, strip on the bottom. This should show a video camera and a microphone. Thank you. I was doing it next to my. Yay. Head. OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, finally. High tech here. So I have two questions. Um, one is, and this applies also to Brightwater, but not Winburg. We have common property that's never been, you know, cleared out at all. So I hate to think how much debris there is. And when I spoke to you last time, um, Kent, about this, you had said it was fine that the likelihood of it catching fire would mostly be from lightning, and that's so rare. And thank you for your talk. And then the other question is, um, the, we have several empty lots that don't have um, labels, as you said, you know, addresses on them. Is that necessary for those people to put up an address? Oh, so so they haven't built on them yet? Correct. Just, yeah. No, I, I don't think so. Um, what usually happens is when people decide to build, they might hire a contractor and they start cutting trees and they might burn the brush. And, and if that case, if something got away, uh, we would want it to be called in by the closest house. You know, like that's it's it's right next to 25 uh, Pasture Lane or whatever that is, you know. But um, I also wanted to talk about the common property because um, the, the real question is, do people access that property? I mean, are there paths where they're walking in there? Um, or is it just you it's is it in the center and you just use you, you see in from the the kind of the loop road there or can you describe it for us? It, it, just as you described it, it's right in the center. People used to use it as a with a path, but I think with all the ticks and whatnot, I don't think anybody uses it as a as a cut through anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody who's online here know about that? Right. Uh, and uh, Wildcat Ledge is still accessible. There are paths up to it from a couple of different sides on Brightwater. And yes, people do go up there. And uh, I don't know. The, I always worry about kids going and smoking, you know, <laughs> smoking a cigarette or a joint or something up in the woods. That's what I happens do, in Island, I think. I do walk the dogs through the center uh, pretty often uh, these days. I don't meet anybody up there, but Jill and I and the dogs are up there. Are, are, are you talking about Winburg or Brightwater? I'm talking about uh, the common land in the middle of uh, Winburg East. Winburg, okay. Yeah. Well, th th this is good to know because um, over 90% of the wildfires in Maine are human caused. So they're, they're, lightning is very rare, but we have had some lightning fires this summer. But with with cause being human, it, it doesn't mean intentional. It could be accidental. Um, so if you've got a place that people are accessing, uh, that could be adding risk. But I do like the idea that it's being sort of checked on when you're walking your dogs, right? So if you see signs of life or 
partying, you know, beer bottles or whatever, then then that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I don't think it would be in that area. The dogs are not partying up here. No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is Alwyn, and we've been enjoying the hike up in the Wildcat Ledge area in the middle of the Brightwater Circle, and we did see a fire ring there, and we broke it up and threw all the rocks away. But it would probably be good if um, maybe Brightwater and Winber just could keep telling people not to do that because that does seem very risky. You did the right thing um, to make just scatter the rocks. And we, we have some signs that could be put up that say Kindle No Fire. Um, but basically keep an eye on things. And uh, we do have the local ranger on the on the video call today. And uh, hopefully when we come down to do the brush chipping, I'll have her uh, stop by and maybe see where this location is. And then in her patrols, she can check on it. But it, it really is good that the community checks on it. and you know who to call if there's any problems. Uh, Kent, if we could get some of those signs, that would be really, really excellent. Uh, I, I was thinking about, it's not just fires, but it's anything, any open flame, cigarette smoldering, anything. Uh, yeah. I'd really like to mark at the entry points to Wildcat Ledge where they have those paths. I think that would be a really uh, important place to post something like that. And, and I don't want to pick on the people um, from out of state, but if, if you're up here for just a few weeks, I don't know if there's rentals or you're just not familiar with the area and you're used to a community that the fire department is there in five minutes, that's not going to happen here. I mean, there's going to be some response time, at least 20, 30 minutes, and people need to realize that... Um, uh, you need to take these extra precautions. Um, not that you can't have a campfire safely if it's if it's approved within your neighborhood in your own yard, but these these common areas, uh, there's there's a lot of risk there, and uh, I think you guys are doing a good job of kind of uh, patrolling it. I will uh, try to get some signs to you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you oh. so much. Can we well, move? Very helpful. We do this. It's a great um, reminder. Really Can appreciate we your time. I, I, I do miss seeing everyone in person, but I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, on August 11th. And uh, we'll go ahead and shut this down, but I'll, I'll ask some of the rangers to uh, that sat in to, to stay on the call. And we'll have, a, we'll have a short meeting with the rangers afterwards since we got this all dialed up. Mm -hmm. Kent, Kent, I was going to ask if we could meet. You mentioned our local ranger, and based on the pronoun, I'm wondering, is it Amy? No, it's Terry. Terry, you want to say hello while, while you're on the call? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm Terry Teller. I just started um, in the area last August, so I'll Welcome. look forward to getting to meet you all at some point. Excellent. And I'll, I won't I won't embarrass her, but um, she's got kind of a nickname within our agency. She's the fire magnet. Uh, <laughs> whenever she's on duty, she responds to four or five fires a day. <laughs> so she's, no vacation. I'm yeah. hoping that'll slow down now with all this. Yes. So rain. <laughs> if she does visit, let's hope it's on a rainy day like today. <laughs> well, uh, Terry, maybe we'd have you like to have you assigned at a different part of the state in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Terry, no. we're looking forward to meeting you, but hopefully it'll be at a public awareness meeting and not sort of like on the job. That would be great. <laughs> and, you know, maybe maybe I'll have her uh, bring the signs out, you know, that way some yeah. of you can meet her. Uh, if you don't mind, Terry, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. But yeah, for sure. Good day, it's raining. Coordinate. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, thanks, so everyone. Much. It was a great Thank call. You. And look, we're right on time here. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day and let's hope it keeps raining. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. All Thank right. you. Good day.